Thank you very, very much. And thank you so much to Sechen, uh, who has been the most magnificent organiser, uh, and also to Cathy Maloney, who I went to uni with, and uh, who rang me and said, would you come down to Wagga? And uh, I'm always utterly delighted to, uh, to come to the Murrumbidgee. I've got this big spotlight right in my face here. I might just go across to this side and see if I can see your eyes, the whites of your eyes. Um, so it's really fantastic to be here. Um, I think, uh, as, as you heard from Sechen, you know, this is really something that is, is very, very close to my heart. These days, um, I, I spent a lot of time in my, um, uh, in my youth, you know, thinking, like a, a lot of physios, you kind of go, oh, you know, you're in health and you see your friends who've gone on to do law or banking or whatever, and they seem to have these magnificently... Uh, uh, successful financial careers, but they're not happy. And I think, you know, the beautiful thing about working in health is that you're doing something for people all the time, which is really fantastic. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get right down here and talk to you here because otherwise I, I just can't see you. So, um, so I started off, how, well, gosh, how many of you have been to a physio over the years? <laughs> okay. And how many of you were given exercises? And how many of you pretty much stopped doing the exercises the minute the pain went away or when you lost a piece of paper in the car, <laughs> right? Okay, all right. So it is a universal problem. And this is really the problem that I have as a physio. So about after about 10 years uh, of working as a normal physio, I thought, well, how on earth can I get people to actually make some changes that last? And so what I did was I started this business called Physio Size. And what we did is we got people to come once a week and they learned how to do their exercises. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do as a good physiotherapist, so I'm going to get all the people up the back who are killing their necks as they're turning around, turn your chairs around and, and just get yourself a bit comfy there, right? So anybody sort of who's side on, because I'd be losing my duty of care if you end up with a crook neck at the end of this, this talk. Okay. All right. So um, basically people come once a week and we, and we said to people, look, if we built a building the way you sit, it would collapse. And so what we did was we showed people how to make some sort of changes in their life by um, really starting to do um, much more than exercise, really learning about habit change. And that's really where my work really started to change in terms of what I was doing was really looking in the preventative sphere. Then um, at the same time, the, the evidence into sedentary lifestyle, and you guys would have seen, you know, it seems every time you open... Uh, the paper or, or anything like that, there's something else about the impact of sedentary lifestyle. And so um, we started to meld a lot of that research and, and I started to be asked to speak a lot at um, functions at, uh, in, in the media and that's really where I started working on the Today Show, which my mother was so thrilled about because can you imagine she could go to Bridge and say that her daughter was on the telly. So that was very exciting. I also got an interview in the area news in Griffith. That was incredibly exciting for my grandmother. Um, so, you know, it was all, it was all good. And um, then at the same time from there, uh, we started to work very much more in the mind sphere. So we started to work with, um, in the Making Australia Happy and Making Couples Happy, which were ABC series, really looking at the impact of minds and bodies. And so consequently, uh, about 18 months ago, the ABC asked me to do uh, a whole series called uh, The Happy Body at Work. And so now we're going into corporates, talking to people about how do you survive corporate life. And, and I think really as much as um, there are so many sort of um, challenges with being in the bush, um, there are all, also so many positives to living in the bush in terms of community, in terms of support, in, in terms of... Um, you know, awareness of, of all the really good things that happen within a bush community and a regional community as opposed to the isolation um, that so many people experience in the city. So I think, you know, d like never lose sight of how brilliant um, the bush is in terms of creating outcomes that, that we could never really get in the city. I think the big thing that we see is that uh, last week we spoke, as you would all know, it's um, the launch of Mental Health Month this month. And we had a big event at the ABC with the Black Dog Institute on Wednesday. And the head of the Black Dog Institute was saying, you know, the time for separating minds and bodies has completely gone. You know, we cannot consider minds without bodies and we cannot consider bodies without minds. 
But I think the big thing that, that is often forgotten in the mental health picture is the role of the physical and what's happening in terms of how we're using our bodies. And so tonight, I hope by the end of tonight, you're actually going to have some really good things that you can take away and work on straight away in terms of your body. I think the big thing um, that used to happen, I'm going to do a Frank Sinatra now and see if I can actually stand on the stage because I can see some of you are so far down the back there. Um, so the big thing that, that um, has changed is that life used to make us strong. Now, when I was growing up, we grew up, I, I'm Italian, you know, being from Griffith, of course I am. And um, so uh, we grew up next to my grandparents. And so we, you know, we just had a little gate and I would go in every morning and I can remember my grandmother. And she would get up in the morning and she would um, get the copper and she'd have those, you know, that enormous sort of stick in the copper. And then she'd put those sheets like through a mangle and then she'd carry those incredibly heavy sheets out to the line with the, you know, the two posts and the, you know, the bit of wire and she'd stick those things up and they were heavy. Then she'd chop some wood, kill a couple of chickens on the way through, <laughs> take them inside, she'd stock, you know, stock the, the wood-fired stove. She could beat a cake by hand, you know, there was nothing electric. That woman had, oh, and then, then she, we, because, you know, being Italian, you know, they were still really thrilled about um, us polished board floors. You know, you Aussies were sort of there with the carpet. But we still had the, the polished board floors. And she'd have one of those enormous sort of things, you know, that like those, those machines that yeah, you go up and down. So she'd be wrestling this thing up and down the hallway. And then she'd put rags on her feet and, and do this fantastic sort of, you know, sort of sweeping thing to get up and down the thing. I mean, that woman, she had arms like a wrestler. She was so strong. But she had the posture of a countess, you know. It was very, very different times. These days, and when you think also in terms of, you know, even, do you remember winding up a window in a car used to be hard. Turning the wheel of a car was hard. Typewriters were stiff. Um, doors didn't open in front of you. You know, all those things. Kids, as kids, all of us, what did we do? You know, we hung from you know, bloody dangerous yeah. trees and, you know, it was terrific fun. You know, there was nothing better than a tyre hanging from a tree that you could sort of swing on. And now you see that everything in our lives is making us weaker. You know, nothing makes us strong. Doors open in front of us. Anything that you press is so light. And you're seeing this, we're seeing this incredible increase. I'm seeing kids now coming into me with the problems that their grandparents used to get because they're so much weaker than they used to be. You know, they're not hanging off monkey bars. They're not holding onto heavy ropes. They're not doing dangerous things. They're not breaking enough bones. I know that's not bad for you guys, but you know, you kind of think, you know, they need to be doing a few dangerous things in order to get a bit stronger. So we've got this real change in what's happening in terms of life. The other thing is that in years gone by, there was about eight hours of work and there was about eight hours of personal time in which people could actually go and see their community and go to rotary meetings and all those sorts of things because you weren't so exhausted at the end of the day. And then generally people had about eight hours of sleep. The trouble is now work, and, and in all its forms, is now taking about eight to ten hours. We're now trying to carve personal time out of sleep time and consequently, people are sleeping less. And we've surveyed now over about 2,500 people um, with our Happy Body Survey, and we're seeing that this is a really consistent picture. The other thing is in a lot of jobs, people are sitting a whole lot more. There's not the activity base, and computers are really you know, contributing to a lot of that. They're also sitting when they get home, so people, a lot of people who do work in centre jobs are then coming home, and instead of moving around and you know, washing sheets and doing all that sort of stuff, they're sitting at the computer or watching TV, often with a computer and a laptop and all those kind of things as well. And consequently, people are sleeping badly. So th the biggest thing that I see is not so much the point where people are broken down with an injury, with pain, with whatever, but the people are tired. That's me first thing in the morning. <laughs> um, and they're just kind of not feeling as focused as they normally would. Sometimes by 3 o'clock they feel a bit like that. And they're just not feeling as focused. So I think this issue of fatigue is becoming a really big thing. The other thing is that when we started to look at what we could do, we decided that it was very important to try and break up things because 
if we try to look at everything, and as all of you would know in your various fields, whatever your specialty area is, there's often so much that you're asking people to do that people often go, look, it's just too much. So what we did is we took it into four main areas that we knew that the research was very strong. The first thing is stress. And we know that a lot of us are living under enormous mental stress for a variety of reasons. I mean, certainly in this in this region, you've had things that have happened over the last few months that have contributed to an enormous amount of stress. Um, but also you're seeing kids saying they're stressed. You know, you're seeing all manner of, of different stressors happening in people's lives. The other things we know people are sitting a lot and we know they're not moving as much as they should. We also know that people aren't sleeping as well. So when we come to sort of start thinking about making some changes, if I said to you, you have to change everything, then you just go, look, I can't. And in fact, there's a whole stack of research around this in the cardiac area um, that <clears throat> they found that people, even after a major cardiovascular event, were not willing to undertake their rehab, right? And you think, and that included taking their drugs because it felt too much. And so what they did was they did this um, study where they said to people, look, you know you've got to lose weight, you know you've got to get fitter, you know you've got to give up smoking, you know you've got to take your, uh, your drugs and you've got to also change your diet. Don't worry about all of them, think of one thing, right? And what they found is when people felt that they only had to focus on one thing, they were much more likely to make a change. So for you guys, one of those things will be your thing, right? Now, the thing that we realise is a lot of these things are, are not about making changes to, to doing more activity, they're more about habits. And for all of us, if we can find what's called a keystone habit, then that's the thing that's going to really make a difference to the way we look and feel. So, like, for instance, if you've ever thought about you're going to lose weight, right? So you go, okay, I'm going to go on a diet and then the first thing you do is you start to change your food. But then after that, you think to yourself, well, maybe I'll also start walking a little bit because that'll also increase my exercise and then maybe I might maybe stop how much grog I'm having. And that combination of things starts to make you lose weight. But even though you didn't mean to get fit and give up grog, it came from that first habit. So for some of you, the fact that you're working long hours, you're sitting all the time, you therefore don't get time to exercise, therefore when you go to bed, you're not, your body's not that tired, you don't sleep well and therefore you wake up more stressed. For other people, it could be, and that's often a thing that you'll see with people who are perhaps say in, um, in care, where you see people who are used to doing quite a lot of activity, who are spending huge amounts of time sitting, they go to bed, their body's not tired, they don't sleep well and they get stuck in this cycle. For other people, it could be moving. You know, if exercise is the thing that's always been a great thing for you, you love to be active, when you're active, you sleep well, you cope better with life, you don't sit as much, that's your thing. Now, a lot of people I see, you know, for instance, my uncle, he's just had a knee replacement, he's like a bear with a sore head. He can't exercise, he's also got male pain, that's a terrible thing, that male pain. <laughs> much, much worse than female pain, you know. Oh, the way he suffers, I can't tell you. But, and he's Italian, Italian and suffering, that's really bad. So, but you know, without being able to exercise, he's grumpy, he's stressed, he doesn't sleep as well, he's sitting, he's in a really bad space. For other people, it could be sleep, right? We know, certainly when people are getting older, um, they will tend to wake up during the night to go to the toilet, you're getting disrupted sleep. If you've got young kids, they're waking you up at night, you might have a snoring husband or you might be snoring and that's the thing that's keeping you awake. You wake up, you haven't had good sleep, you therefore don't feel like exercising and therefore you sit more. And for some people, it is stress. There might be high levels of depression or anxiety or some major life event that has really affected you. You don't sleep well, you don't feel like exercising and therefore you sit. So what we know with each of you is that there will be one thing that is really the thing that's going to really make an impact on your life. But also, you know that if you just start to do one thing, like exercise a bit more, means you will sleep better, which means you are going to feel less stressed, which you're going to sit less, one of those things will be your thing. So what I want you to think about is which one is your thing? 
So we're going to start off with sitting. And the big thing with sitting is that a lot of us are not only sitting too much, but we're sitting really badly. And they're things, where's my section? Section's going to come and, and do you mind doing my thing in a minute? Um, it's not only that you're sitting really badly, it's also the way that you're sitting. So I want you to sit on the edge of your chair. Come on, sit on the edge of your chair. And I want you to make sure you can see someone, right? So make sure you can sit, have eye contact. So sit right on the edge of your chair and make sure you can have eye contact with someone. <laughs> All right? And what I want you to do is I just want you to slump down, right? Oh, that's easy. And now I want you to look at the person next to you and realise how their IQ just dropped about 10 percentage points. <laughs> can you see? They don't look very attractive anymore, right? Okay, and now I want you to lift up and now look at that person and see how incredibly good looking they are, right? <laughs> suddenly, suddenly you think, now you don't look like you come from Wagga anymore, huh? Okay, now what I want you to do is put one hand on your stomach now, right, put one hand on your stomach, and now I want you to slump down and have a little feel, like, can you feel a little bit of lava went into your hand? Look, can you feel that? All right, and what that is, that's your core turning off, all right? And when your core turns off, it's like an enormous pair of undies that have just let go, all right? You probably don't have to think about that over dessert, but anyway, there you go. All right, so what we know is that not only does that affect our joints, but it also affects our minds. Now, I want you to slump down, slump down again. Come on, that's it. Now, look at the person next to you and try and smile at them, right? Can you see it's quite hard? Now, lift up and now try and smile at them. Look at that, all right? So suddenly, so what we know is there's this very cool research now coming out showing that if you slump, your whole mood slumps. So if you spend the day like this, yes, hi, I'm from local area health, um, chances are people around you are not going to feel that good about you because you look very slumpy and you can't smile at them. So have a look at this. This is one of the clips from our series. And it explains a little bit about how this looks. So hang on, I'll just go to the next one. There you go. Whoops. There. Let's just see how our... Exactly. They'll cut any second now. Here it comes. <laughs> this has never worked with children, video. Oh, there you go. Is there any audio? Oh, there's no audio. There you go. I can hear a little bit. Can you turn it up a little bit? Well, there you go. It says... When you look down, you feel down. So it's very hard. And if you straighten up, it takes the load off. I tell you what, never work with video, really. <laughs> there you go. But it's a very cute thing. So what you realise is that when you slump down, your mood slumps. And the most important... Oh, my God, now we've lost our slides completely. Okay. Uh, it's not on mine? Okay. All right. Oh, it's fallen out. That's okay. All right, so... The next thing that we're going to learn is that in order to remember how to sit up, now a lot of physios would have told you a million different ways to sort of sit up straight and all that sort of stuff, but in fact there's a really, really simple thing. So sit on the edge of your chair again. You've got to sit right on the edge. <laughs> oh, come on. You've only had a very nice meal and a bit of dessert. Okay, now I want you to slump down and what you're going to imagine is that you've got a light shining out of your chest and your light is now shining down to the floor, right? Now, for the next however long, I want you to remember this. I want you to shine your light, as Kath and Kim would say, shine your light straight ahead, right? And now look how gorgeous those people at the table look <laughs> next to you, right? You've just shined your light at them and suddenly they look terrific. Now, the most important thing is not to beam up too high, right? <laughs> because if you do, you will not only get back pain, but it also looks a little odd. So I want you to stand up now. So stand up. Have we got it back? All right, let's see if we get it back. Okay, so you, you stand up and now I want you to find someone right next to you, right, and look at them and I want you to let your light go down. And now look at them. Oh, my God. They look terrible. It's been a long day. We're a bit tired. Okay, and now I want you to give them a quick beam, right, and just see how good they look. Fantastic. Wonderful. In okay. Give them a quick beam up and you will see. It's not there. Okay. And you will see how absolutely terrific they look. So when you're walking around, right, 
the best thing to think about is about shining your light, all right? Now, if you're walking up the street, a big thing that you will see, particularly those of you who are working in aged care facilities, and I want you to go straight to those facilities and tomorrow I want you to teach people to shine their light because what you'll see is those poor people in their walkers, right, their lights will be so far down I can't tell you, right? And then all you need to do is go, shine your light, Dulcie, and she'll just perk up, all right? So it's about lifting it up because what you'll find is that people... <laughs> What you'll find is that people will be worried that they're going to fall. So they take their eyes down, but when their eyes go down, their light goes down as well. So a big part of thinking about being upright is about thinking about shining your light, okay? So first thing, shine your light. Have a seat. All right. Now the next thing you're going to learn, oh, wonderful, we're back. Oh, and now my thing's probably not working. So the next thing is that we've got... When you slump down, put one finger in, in your chest just there and the other finger in your belly button. You might have to go in a little bit deep there, okay? All right, now I want you to slump down and I want you to measure the space between those two. You can do it. Oh, my goodness, how badly behaved. Slump down and show me what the distance is between those two points. Just, just lift up and show me what that distance is, all right? Now, I want you to think about this. In that space, you have 18 feet of guts. 18 feet, right? Now, shine your light and now measure that space and have a look now. That's how much space guts need, all right? So if one more person tells me that they have, you know, problems with, you know, celiac disease or whatever, I say, no, you've got squishy gut syndrome, right? <laughs> Because if you sit down with your light down and you slump down, your eating slump, think of all those poor people, they get served their meals, they're not standing up, they're slumped down, it really contributes not only to their neck but also to their guts, all right? So if you don't want squishy gut syndrome, shine your light, okay, all right. So that's the number one thing. Now, the other very cool thing is this. This is Doris Day. Now, there's some very interesting research. When... In 1952, there was a whole stack of research looking at the average size of a British woman. I'm sure a lot of you men will remember that kind of, uh, that look, um, even though she's not British. But, you know, how women used to have, do you remember how your grandmothers could tell you what size waist they had? Well, some of you could tell you I had a 16-inch waist or I had an 18-inch waist, all right? And men also had very different figures. So they did this thing in 1952 and that's where all our dress sizes come from. You know how, you know, size 8, so thing. And interestingly, it hadn't been done again until 2010, right? And what they did was in 2010, they redid these stats and what they found is that the average British woman had gone from 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 4, right? She was... Three inches, so three inches taller, four kilos heavier, right? Which kind of makes sense. You know, you think, well, you're three inches taller. Her bust was five centimetres bigger. Her hips were five centimetres bigger. But the average British woman's waist was 20 centimetres bigger. Right? Completely different shape. And that's why, how many people do you see looking like this anymore? And I would say that this is a big part of the problem. When you sit on the edge, sit on the edge and have a feel of the flubber, right, and slump down, there's the 20 centimetres, right? If you think back to the 50s, slumping was rude, right? How many of us were told by all our parents, sit up straight, put your shoulders back, don't slump at the table, don't, exactly, don't put your elbows on the table, all that kind of stuff. What do my kids look like? Right? <laughs> Slump down at the table, elbows on the table, they don't use their bodies. And if you think back to schools, remember how there used to be wooden benches with angle desks, right? That kept you up like that. You couldn't slump on those bloody things. It hurt your back, right? <laughs> then we got those bucket seats and flat things and what happened? Everyone went down with it. So shining your light is going to make a big difference not only to your body, not only to your guts, not only to your neck, right, but also to the way you look. So there's got to be some very good things about shining your light. Now, when we think about sleep, the big thing with sleep is often not what's happening in bed, even though 
Speed is certainly a big part of it, but it's often what's happened during the day. Now, if you're feeling a bit tired and flat, just see if this sort of looks like something. You might wake up, say, a little bit tired, and then you think, well, maybe I might have a little coffee, right? And then that gives you a little lift, and then you go, well, it's about 10 o'clock, I'm feeling a bit flat again, I might have a little muffin. And then you get to 12 o'clock and you think, hmm, I might just have a little cup of tea, maybe another little muffin. And then at 4 o'clock you think to yourself, oh, look, bugger it, I'll hit the chocolate. And by that stage you get home and you're a little bit tired, you've been going, you've had coffee and chocolate. And so what do you do? Oh, I think I might have a little glass of wine. And then that felt so good, I might have another glass of wine. And then by 8 o'clock you think, oh, I'll have a third glass of wine. By that stage you go to bed and you are unconscious. But when you actually... Go to sleep, you'll go into a very deep sleep, but then what happens at three o'clock? You wake and worry, right? And how many of us know that that's a pattern that we get into? And what we know about exercise is that if you stand up regularly during the day, about six to eight times an hour, and that's just, you know, try and think to yourself, what's something that happens regularly in my day, in my thing? You know, it might be finishing a phone call, might be sending an email, stand up, sit down. We know what that does is it stops these wild fluctuations in blood sugar. In fact, we've just done, we've just done a great project with Optus in Adelaide at their contact centre. And, uh, and I thought all contact centres were in India, but they're not. There's a whole <laughs> stack in Australia. And, and it's really interesting, like you go there. And so what I taught them to do was stand up after every call. And what was fantastic is that we went back after six weeks and I'm kind of looking around and it was brilliant. It was like seeing a whole stack of meerkats. You know, like all of a sudden you see this thing and then you can see people standing up and then sitting down. I thought that is fabulous, right? So I want you to think about your awful open plan offices, which I absolutely hate. Um, and I want you to think about encouraging people to be meerkats and get them to stand up and sit down. And, you know, for, for people who go to bridge, you know, I just think there should be almost a bell at the, the end of every sort of change thing where everybody has to stand up and sit down because sitting is a disaster for all of us no matter what age. So in terms of sleep, the big thing with sleep is um, trying not to have, trying to move more during the day so you have these less fluctuations. Trying to not, for those of you who are still sort of sitting in front of the TV with your iPad and your phone and your computer checking your emails and watching TV, it's not so good for your brain, right? So when you do try to go to bed, it's very hard to switch off. And for those of you that fall asleep in front of the TV, you know who you are, right? Make sure, go to bed when you start feeling tired because what we know from the data is when you go to sleep, that first sleep will be your deepest sleep. So when you then go to bed, you will not have as deep a sleep as you had in that chair and it really disrupts your sleep cycle. So sleep is a really big thing. And if you have young children that are waking you up, you can always sell them for medical experimentation. You know, that's, that's always, there's a lot of money on the black market for that. Um, so then we talk about stress. And I think, you know, with stress, often there, there's nothing, there's, a lot of stress is out of our control. So, so that's kind of part of the picture that, that we need to deal with. But it's more about what happens physically when you start to get really overloaded. And, and a big part of the stress picture is thinking, what is actually happening? What is your stress sign when you start to get really overloaded? So one of these things will be your thing. And I want you to think, which of those things do you know is, is the thing that happens to you? When you get really overloaded, do you get the flu? Is it your immune system? That, that's the man flu, terrible flu, all right? But is that the thing that happens to you? Do you get the flu? Or do you get gastro? Do you get the runs? Or does your tummy start to play up? With other people, it's musculoskeletal. They might get a migraine or maybe your back goes or something like that happens. For some people, it's respiratory. Every year about October, it's coming. When, when you know, I've been doing a lot of speaking, I get this weird virus and the first thing that happens is I lose my voice, right? My husband says it's an act of God, but... <laughs> I don't agree with that. I know that's really, that's the thing for me. You know, if I can't speak, I can't teach. And that's really what I do for a living. So for some people, it might be nervous system. This happens a lot in the over 50s, shingles, right? But for some people, it's cold sores, so it might be mouth ulcers. 
Or is it cardiovascular? Does your blood pressure go up? Or perhaps it's hormonal. You might see your cholesterol really starts to jump. Or for some people, it's dermatological. You might get, you know, maybe um, eczema or a rash or you might get rosacea or something like that. So I want you to think to yourself, and for some people, it will take the flu, a bout of the runs, a migraine, uh, a case of shingles, a heart attack and eczema before they go, yeah, actually, maybe I'm not coping, right, <laughs> with life. So what I want you to think about is which do you think is your sign? Now, for some of you, you will just get incredibly tired, right? So for some people, it's just tiredness. But I want you to turn to the person next to you who you've never met before and tell them whether you get the run. So off you go. <laughs> okay, talk about your stress sign. There you go. Oh, good. The what happened? Wasn't plugged in. Oh, great. Oh, and okay. then thing fell out. I had to read it. Oh, okay. Like, that's what so it was. Done. Good. Good, good, good. Oh, no. There you go. There's I chew my nose. Can it? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a new one. Very good. Is that going okay? Okie dokie, so after I finish you can continue your discussion later about which of those things are your stress signs. But it's amazing once you start to recognise, you know, it's kind of like driving a car and ignoring all those signals on the dashboard, you know. You just keep going thinking, look, it'll be fine, I'm still running, so how bad can it be? But after a while, it's your body that stops you. And I think in the mental health, in the physical health arena, we're often dealing with the end of a huge amount of mental stress. And it's often far more acceptable to say, I've got a migraine or my back's gone or something like that, than to say, actually, I'm not coping with all these things that are going on. And, and I, th I think often in the physical arena, that's where, that's where we really have a big role to play to say to people, do you know what, you really do need to maybe think about getting some help about all those other things that are stressing you. The other thing is, when do you crash? Because most people, they don't crash when the pressure is on, right? You just keep going and going and going. When do you crash? When the pressure goes off. How many of you have gone on a holiday and all of a sudden you spend the first week of the holiday sick or your back goes, I had a very funny phone call, well it wasn't very funny, from a patient of mine, mine, he's a judge, right? He flies all over Australia and he'd been working so many hours and I said to him, look, you've just got to be careful you know, your back is not great. He goes, it'll be fine. We're going to France. We're going to have the holiday of a lifetime. It's going to be fantastic, right? I said, well, I'm, you know, really concerned about you. Anyway, two days later, off they fly. I get this phone call. Hello? I said, what are you doing? Aren't you in France? He goes, I am. He said, I'm in Paris airport on a stretcher bed because I went to lift my bag off the carousel. Oh, his back went and he's being transported off to hospital with his back having gone. And I thought, you could have seen it coming, you know, a million miles away, but he just pushed and pushed and pushed till his body stopped him. He had an excellent holiday, met a lot of French nurses. He said it was very good. So, <laughs> all right. Now, the last thing that we know is that moving is really, really important. Now, there's three parts to moving that we know. The first thing is we know if you move regularly. So, that whole standing up, sitting down. So, you know, for some, some of you, you never sit. If you talk to my mother, she says, I never sit. Well, she does sit when she goes to, to bridge or something like that. But a lot of people um, in, in that generation don't sit a whole lot more. In our generation, it's a whole lot more sitting. So what we need to do is remind ourselves to stand more often. And often that means things like, like I've set up a, um, uh, you know, where you've got your phone table and all that sort of stuff. Instead of having it a place where you would sit, set it up as somewhere that's about belly button height so that you stand when you're on the phone or you stand when you're, you know, doing your paperwork or whatever. Often it's just a matter of thinking about positioning things in the house so you don't sit down. Now, the second thing is buy a pedometer. How many of you have you had a pedometer, right? They know that if you buy a pedometer, you will increase your activity levels by 60% in the first week. How good is that, right? Unfortunately, after the third week, it drops off a bit, but... 
It is very, very good. They know that long term you will increase your activity by 27% if you have a pedometer, right? So particularly for men, it's a great way. They like a number. I have one of my, um, one of my uh, staff's husbands got one the other day and she said <laughs> she saw him. It was about 10 o'clock at night and she said she could hear him marching up and down the hallway. She was saying, what are you doing? And he goes, I've just got 200 more steps to go. <laughs> so, you know, that whole 10,000 step thing is a really good thing. The third thing that we know, so we know that that, that incidental activity and that, that 10,000 steps is going to have huge health outcomes. But the third thing we know is that you need a bit of huff and puff exercise, right? And huff and puff is really important not only for your cardiovascular well-being but for your mental well-being because... They've done a lot of studies where they're starting to think that maybe when... Have you ever done so much exercise that you thought you were going to die? You know, you know that feeling where you kind of, you've gone up a hill or something like that and you go... <gasps> right? And you start feeling a bit panicky, your heart rate goes up, you start to sweat. Well, that is almost the identical thing that happens to you when you're under mental stress, right? You start, your heart rate starts to go up, you start to feel panicky. And what they think is that that... Physical stress is a metaphor in your brain for mental stress. So the next time you feel incredibly stressed, your body says, oh, I recognise this and I didn't die, right? So maybe I'm going to be okay. So we're starting to understand that mental that um, huff and puff is really important. Now, the trick is, though, most of us think that we're doing huff and puff, but we're not, right? So if you're taking the dog for a walk and you're walking along and then you wait for a little poo from the dog and then, then you walk a little bit more, that is not huff and puff exercise, right? We've got to get it to moderate to vigorous and moderate to vigorous will be different for all of us, right? So when you're at moderate to vigorous, you can talk but you can't sing, right? So you can talk but you can't sing. So if you went to sing, you would go <gasps> because your body is looking for more um, more oxygen. So we're going to stand up. Stand up and make sure you've got a bit of space around you. All right? And what we're going to do is we're going to sing row, row, row your boat. And at the same time, we're going to march, right? And we need to get some big legs and big arms going, okay? Now, if you are very fit, right, those fabulous athletes in the room, you need to run while we're doing this, okay? But the rest of us can just march, all right? And when you get to the point where you go <gasps> row, that is moderate to vigorous for you, right? So the next time you go for a walk, you'll know how much we need to walk. And we'll talk about how much that is, okay? So are you ready? We're going to go. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Louder. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Bigger. Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Faster. Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Bigger arms. Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Quick. Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Stop and talk to someone. Quick. Talk. <laughs> Okay, have a seat. Well done. <laughs> very, very good. So you can see, you can see what a lovely mood lifter row, row, row your boat is <laughs> and how you need to get to that point where you're at huff and puff. Now, for those of you who can't walk quickly because your knees are crook or your hips are crook or whatever, this is where something like an exercise bike or, you know, some aqua or something like that needs to come in. And, you know, when you think about your elderly patients, they need a bit of row, row, row your boat, you know. They need a bit of huff and puff because that's the thing that is so protective against depression. So there's some really, really good stuff coming out about that. Now, this is a little clip from this series that kind of summarises the whole thing. Oh, no. Oh. Mm, our audio's not working. So basically what it says is you need these three things. You need a bit of incidental activity, 
you need a little bit, or you need 10,000 steps. And finally, you need a little huff and puff exercise for a real mood lift <laughs> and a better night's sleep. Now we did this at, we did this at, my, um, at my work and one of my staff rang me the next day and she goes, thanks very much. Her husband was at this talk and she goes, last night Kevin said he needed a bit of huff and puff to get to sleep. I said, that is not what I meant at all, okay? I'm sure a bit of huff and puff does help you get to sleep but it's not what I'm talking about, okay? So that's probably a bit of that incidental activity again that, that we weren't talking about. So now I want you to think, okay? I want you to think to yourself, look at those four cards. You've got four cards in front of you. Can you grab me a set of cards? Can you grab me a set of cards? And you'll have which of these things out of sleep, stress, moving and sitting are you going to choose? So for some of you, you think to yourself, do you know what? I know if I move a little bit more, I will sit a bit, a li bit less, which means I'm going to sleep a bit better, which is going to help me cope with stress. Or do you think that actually it's about sitting? That you really need to get off your bum, you've got to try and work out ways to sit less and therefore <coughs> you're going to move more, which means you're going to sleep better, which means you're going to deal with stress better. For some people, is it sleep? You need to go to bed a bit earlier. You're going to bed, you're staying, falling asleep in front of the telly or you're staying up too late. If you get a bit of better sleep, you know you're going to feel better, wake up clearer, more able to deal with stress, feel more like exercising, feel more like moving. Or do you think it's stress? Is it that you really need to go and maybe talk to someone or you need to change time management skills, sell your children, do something like that? But whatever it is, it's about dealing with that stress. You know, if you deal with that, you're going to sleep better, feel like exercising and move more. So I want you to put the card that you think is your one on the top, all right? So put the card that you think is your one on the top. And some of you might have more than one, but just think which one am I going to work on first? And then I want you to hold it over your head towards me, right? Hold it over your head towards me. Perfect. And now I want you to look around the room and see how many different variations there are. Some of you are asleep, some of you are moving, some of you are exercise, some of you are sitting. Okay, and now I want you to get your wallet out. You don't have to give me a donation. I want you to get your wallet out and I want you to put the four cards on top of your favourite credit card. All right? So get it out, get your wallet out and put it on top of your favourite credit card. And so every time you get your wallet out, you think, you know what? I'm going to start dealing a little bit with my choose one. So you put it on top of your favourite credit card. And then what you'll find is as one thing starts to change, other things will start to flow from that. The good thing with the choose ones, go back to your, you know, whether it's, your, it's people that, that you know, your friends, whether it's your work environment, whatever it is, start talking to people about, you know, these small things. It's not big stuff. Sit a little bit less, move a little bit more, you will sleep a little bit better, which is going to make you more resilient to stress. And that's the big message that we can take into the community. It doesn't cost anything. It's very, very small, but it can be very, very powerful in terms of making differences. So. The last thing when, when, I, when um, Sechen asked me to speak to you about mind, body and soul, I, I really kind of look back to the work we did in the Making Australia Happy series and the Making Couples Happy series because what we know from that research is that there's three key things. The first one is that people who give are happier and so many of you volunteer, right? And we know that people who volunteer the, the, the magic figure seems to be about 100 hours a week, uh, 100 hours a week, 100 hours a year. If you, if you volunteer, 100 hours a week you're dead, um, but 100 hours a year seems to be the magic figure that if you volunteer 100 hours a year, your, your life expectancy increases, your levels of well-being increase and your physical well-being increases. So a lot of you already sit in that very warm space where, the, where you're doing a lot of giving. The second thing that we know is that the more grateful you are, the happier you're going to be. And you know, that, that whole thing about, I loved this thing from the, um, 
from the when we did Making Australia Happy, we learned that if you just think every day of three good things that happen in your day, and my kids hate this because over dinner I say, so what's one of your good things today? And they go, oh, mum, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> but I tell you what, it does get you starting to think, you know, and it might just be it was a beautiful day or it might be it rained, right, or it might be someone smiled at me or, you know, it might be something very, very small. It can be very small things but it can make such a difference to your soul, starting to refocus your mind on things that you're grateful for. It might be thank you for all being here today, you know, and having such a positive environment and supported environment to work in. And the last thing that we know is let go and this was absolutely brilliant. Russell Harris, Dr. Russ Harris was one of the experts in the series and he did this fantastic thing where he got, he got, they went down to the beach and they dug an enormous sand hole and he got this girl that we were working with who was miserable and was going through a terrible divorce and he put her on one side of the hole and he stood on the other side of the hole and he put this big rope between them and he said, I want you to pull that rope as hard as you can, right? Because really that's what you're doing you're holding on to all this stuff that you're so angry about and and all the problems that you got and you're trying to pull things in and he said and while you're holding on to all that stuff I want you to think about how much you love your kids and what things are positive in your life and and all the things that you want to do and he said it's impossible to do those things if you're holding on to all this other anger and he said when you let go and so you've got to let go of the rope and he said those things are still there. They're still sitting down the hole, but you're not trying to pull yourself into it. And I thought, you know what, there's something really to be said from that in terms of really looking after your soul. There's so many things that you can't control. And the more you hold on to them, you know, often the only person that's suffering is you. So I think when I did Making Australia Happy and Making Couples Happy, that was the most powerful thing that I learned was sometimes letting go is the hardest but the most valuable thing to do. So we've learned so much tonight, hopefully. It's not like a normal dinner. You've learned what you choose one is. You've learned three things that are good for your soul. And, um, you know, it's been really beautiful to be here in the Murrumbidgee, one of my favourite places in the world. I keep telling people how great it is. And they go, really? I go, yes, it's fantastic. So let's bring as many people as possible down in the Murrumbidgee. Thank you for having me. You can now drink heavily and uh, dance heavily, no injuries. Well, you're in the right place if you do get an injury anyway. There's enough physios and uh, um, medicos in the room. And uh, I hope you have a terrific night. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.